It's such a joy to be with you again today. And today we're looking and we'll continue our study on this mentoring, mentoring personal development program. And really, today we're looking at values. There are some things that you need to develop if you're going to understand even time management correctly. If you're going to understand goal setting correctly, you must have some governing values. Things that you, by virtue of your own desire, determination, conviction, you want to develop in your life so that you do not compromise certain values. And, you know, I have a material here that tells us of the values that uh, uh, Mr. Benjamin Franklin, when he was 22 years old and had gone through quite a bit of things in his past, he came up with 12 values and uh, he wrote them down as a written statement and there are things that to help you understand values a bit. It says temperance. And under temperance, it, it says, eat not to dullness, drink not to elevation. Silence, speak not, but what may benefit others or yourself. Avoid trifling conversation. Order, let all things have their place. Let each part of your business have its time. Re resolution, resolve to perform what you ought, perform without fail what you resolve. Now that gives you an idea. Sincerity, use no hurtful deceit. Think innocently and justly, and if you speak, speak accordingly. Moderation, avoid extremes, forbear resenting injuries so much as you think they deserve. Uh, cleanliness, tolerate no uncleanliness in body, clothes, or habit habitation. Chastity, rarely use venery but for health or offspring, never to dullness, weakness, or the injury of your own or another's peace or reputation. Franklin took these 12 statements to a Quaker friend of his and asked his opinion of them. The Quaker friend looked at them and informed Franklin that he had forgotten one, humility. <laughs> he kindly informed me, said Ben, that I was generally thought proud, that my pride's, pride showed itself frequently in conversation, that I was not content with being in the right when discussing any point, but was overbearing and rather insolent, of which he convinced me by, mentor, by mentioning several instances. So Franklin added a thirteenth virtue, humility. He wrote a four-word statement describing what it meant to him, imitate Jesus and Socrates. So what are the values again? Temperance, silence, order, resolution, frugality, make no expense but to do good to others or to yourself that is waste nothing. Industry, lose no time, be always employed in something useful, cut off all unnecessary actions. Sincerity, use no hurtful deceit. Justice, wrong none by doing injuries or omitting the benefits that are your duty. Moderation, avoid extremes, cleanliness, tolerate uncleanliness. Tranquility, be not disturbed by tr at trifles or at in accidents common or, an, or, or, or unavoidable. And then chastity, I read that earlier. Now you add humility. Now these are the values that eventually when Benjamin Franklin was to be involved in the Constitution of America. These are the values that he had in his in his heart, in his mind, that he used to form the Constitution. Now, what does this do to you as a person? You should understand that your governing values are the foundation of personal fulfillment. In other words, as a Christian, what are the values you should have? Well, in my opinion, values of honesty, integrity, loyalty, and being a blessing to others, adding value to others, are some of the values you can develop. And let me say this already. Everybody's got his value system. It's just a matter of identifying it inside you. Because everybody's got some value. Well, if you don't have the ones that are maybe of biblical standards, you could develop them. But you need to have those values in place. And what do I mean by that? There's this thing I read some time ago about the I-beam the eye beam is a long uh, beam that when you put it across, it can bridge between, uh, like the, the, the story goes like this. Somebody brought an eye beam and it says, would you like to walk across this eye beam for $10? If you're not broke, you might say, why do I bother? If, you're, if you want $10, it's very easy. Walk across the eye beam and you got $10. He said, but if the eye beam was now put across the two tallest buildings in, the, in New York, and you're now told to walk across the I-beam. 
then your life is at stake. At that point, $10 will not be sufficient. Maybe if you had $20,000, maybe, depending on who you are. But immediately, you find out that your value system immediately changes. Why? Because now, something of value to you is at stake, is at risk. So you don't want to change, you don't want to do that. What does that tell you? That means you value your life more than you value the money that you'll be offered. But let's take the same scenario and we now have your daughter, your only child. If you were told that her life was at stake, except you cross that I-beam from one end of a high-rise building to the other high-rise building and nothing underneath it, if you make a mistake, you're going to drop to your death. Would you do it for your daughter's sake? Now, that's when you understand you got values, but you may not have identified them. In other words, your daughter's life will be more valuable to you than anything else. Why? Because you love her and because she's your daughter. So that's why it's, it's important that, you know, we all know that we have some values. Now, if our upbringing is brought into our minds or into our lives, values that are not worthy, well, we have a choice. We can change them. Yes, and thank God that those of us who are in the Word of God, we can change our values based on the Scriptures. And that's why I love God's Word. I love God's Word so much because most of the things I need and you need in life, they're found in the Word. Not only did God give you the Word, He also gave you His Spirit to help you interpret, decipher, understand the Word, and help you to build the right values into your life. And it's this area of personal battles that a lot of times people fail. You see, a lot of us will rather come to a mentoring program like this only to be told how to make more sales, how to grow a big church, how to be very successful outwardly. But many times, the inward uh, developments are left unattended to. And that's the reason why so many times when we are, uh, succeed outwardly and we don't have an internal character, internal fortitude to handle our outward success, we collapse on it. Have you heard of people who succeed in business, come into millions, and then suddenly things fall apart in their homes, things fall apart in their personal lives, they get depressed, things just don't work out fine. You know why? They never developed the internal before they developed the external. I remember the scripture that Paul was telling Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, I think it is. It says that you should commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others. Now, in the world today, we will commit to able men who we hope will be faithful to teach others. In other words, we will look at the external qualities before we look at the internal qualities. Why? Because that's the way the world runs. That's the way we think. That's the way human beings think. Because the Bible says God looks at the heart. We human beings look to the outward. So when somebody is doing fine and they're succeeding in life and has the money flowing and he has the relationships in place, hey, we say he's a successful guy. And we're right to some extent. He is. But if he lacks the character internally, he can't sustain that success. And that is what this mentoring is about is to build in you the internal fortitude first, the quality. How do I develop integrity? Well, it starts by, the word integrity means integer, being whole. In other words, say what you mean and mean what you say. And when you say it, back it with action. That's the beginning of integrity. It's as simple as that, but it, it can take you a while to build it into your system. What about humility? Humility is not, I'm no good, I'm, I'm, I'm a worm. No, you're not a worm, you're a human being. Humility is a recognition of my dependence on God. That's simply what humility is. In other words, whatever I am, I attribute it to God. Whatever I have, God gave it to me. Why am I so dependent on Him? That's exactly the way He created us to function. Many people don't know that. That's how he designed that we should function. 
will depend just like uh, you know the engine depends on the f supply of petrol and the know-how of the driver for it to do what it's supposed to do everything is connected to everything god designed you and i to be dependent on him so humility simply means taking my rightful place in the scheme of things that's humility an example when Peter uh, was used to raise the guy who was uh, the get beautiful silver or gold of I number such as I have I give you in the name of Jesus rise up and walk what was it that the guy what was it that the guy did Peter said why look at us and see if it's by our own holiness and whatever we made this man whole he said but faith in the name of Jesus made him whole now what is Peter trying to do when you're used of God to heal like that the tendencies for your flesh your humanity to take it over and yeah, I achieve this in my strength. But Peter immediately recognizing that that would be a possibility because he had been discipled. He had been mentored by the master himself. So he knew that truth in this context will mean keeping himself in a state of humility. And in that case, he embraced truth. He said, it's not my holiness without undermining holiness. It's not my righteousness without undermining right. It's not my effort without undermining his effort. He said, but faith in the name of Jesus made this man whole. So that is where humility comes in. Humility does not mean uh, I can do nothing. You know, even David killing Goliath can be seen as a humble thing. <laughs> You know, a lot of people think David killing a lad is, no, no, it's a humble thing. Why? He said, you come against me with swords and stabs, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, whose army you defy. So you can see what David said there. David was clearly saying, I am a representative of Almighty God, and I am going to bring your head down because you have crossed the boundaries. But he was not looking to himself. That's humility. He was looking to the greater one, to God Almighty. So when we when we begin to appreciate these kind of values, then it will be easier to build them into our hearts because now we see. Because if you don't if you don't take time, the, the these values will come across from religious spirits. Humility means I'm a no good. I have nothing. No, humility knows what I have, but he knows where I got it from. Humility knows who I am, but he knows who made me so. <laughs> humility knows what I can do, but who he knows who gave me the strength. Humility knows what is available, but he knows who his source is. Now, these are the principles that make for humility. And a lot of people don't develop those things. So when they begin to learn how to succeed in life, they begin to get puffed up, they begin to get swollen-headed, and they don't understand. No, it's not, it's not, humility is not ignorance. Humility is not even weakness. Humility is strength under control. That's what humility really is, because it's from the same root word with meekness. It's called praktos in the Greek word. And the, the, the root word is like a stallion, a, 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 a racehorse, you know. But when it's, a racehorse is broken and it's subject to its rider, it's called meek, teachable. And that's the same root word from which humility came out so i just wanted to share some of these values with you because of course you need to develop yours you need to know who you are because in the course of developing you will find out that maybe you work in fear you work in insecurity you work in pride you work in you know all those kind of things that you were nurtured with or your nature in adam had deposited in your soul remember james 1 21 says that we should lay aside uh, naughtiness and uh, uh, filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. Now, the, the, the problem is that your recreated spirit needs a participation with your soul for the true nature of God in you to give expression. So where your mind, your will, and your emotions are concerned, which is what your soul is about, there are things that have been deposited in that realm of your life that need to go, and you need to work at it. So you need to develop all these qualities and, you know, because you already have some of them already, so it's not like you're going to develop the whole thing. But as you add it to your arsenal, your knowledge, so what do you do? You set goals right now. I want to work more in integrity. I, I want to catch myself if I have to tell a lie at any time to repent of it. I want to catch myself if I have to do anything that's contrary to my value system. I want to have the Christ-like value on the inside of me and I want to work in integrity, honesty, uh, loyalty, and add value to others. I also want to work in the humility of my heart. Now, you know the greatest help you've got? The Holy Spirit. You can talk to Him. 
You can He will quicken scriptures in your mind, scriptures about the fruit of the Spirit and things like that. So as you build those things into your heart, into your character, you find out that you will be more joyful. You have more rest in your life. You won't have all the agitation and competition and envy and jealousy and all the stuff that make people fail. You won't have them. But you would rather develop the quiet, the meek and quiet spirit that only Christ can make available to you. Until I come your way next time, you know what? I'm praying for you that God will perfect everything that concerns you. God bless you and thanks for spending your time with us. God bless you.